Welcome to Feminist Frequency Radio. This is the show that asks you to be critical of the media you love. I'm Anita Sarkeesian. And I'm Kat Spada, capital A, capital P. And this season, we are playing a high stakes virtual reality game of biomechanical engineering. In other words, we're watching cyberpunk tech and hacking movies to see how Hollywood attempted to put the World Wide Web, capital W's, in all of those (laughs) on screen. Mr. Deckard, Dr. Eldon Terrell. The new millennium. This is amazing. We'll bring a new experience. How do you fit all that in your head anyway? I had to dump a chunk of long-term memory. This is going to be fun, Terry. Who is this? Take this thing out of the case and stick it up your nose. Mozart's ghost, the hottest band on the internet. This week, we watched Existence, and while you may think that sounds like an off-brand male enhancement supplement, it's actually a sci-fi film from David Cronenberg. The filmmaker, known for his work defining the body horror genre like The Fly and Dead Ringers, made waves at the Cannes Film Festival this year with his feature Crimes of the Future. Back in 1999, after interviewing Salman Rushdie for Shift magazine, Cronenberg reportedly came up with the idea of, quote, a fatwa against a virtual reality game designer. In existence, Jennifer Jason Lee stars as the designer of the titular game, kind of, leading a cast that includes <laughs> Jude Law, Ian Holm, Sarah Polly, Christopher Eccleston, and Willem Dafoe. There's an intimacy involved in playing existence that is beyond description. You just pop your spine with a little hydro gun. Break out of your cage, Paco. I haven't crippled anyone yet. Step into my office. Now I'm warning you. It's going to be a wild ride. Joining us today is the wonderful actor, producer, and writer Christian Brun, known for his work in film and television, including The Handmaid's Tale, Murdoch Mysteries, and Snowpiercer. He's currently reprising his role as Donnie Hendricks, everyone's favorite dad in the podcast <laughs> Orphan Black, the next chapter. Welcome to the show, Christian. Hey, thanks for having me. So we are recording this uh, the day after Father's Day, and you have this amazing mustache. And so it's it's pretty full. Yeah, you're just like this dad energy all around. And I'm wearing like a chambray shirt, which is kind of my look. (laughs) And that doesn't help either. Yeah. 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 I like to wear sort of anything denim or denim like and Mm. uh, just showing up for this. Uh, also, thank you so much for letting me be on this Cronenberg ep- episode because because uh, he's he's a Toronto guy, so and so am I. So uh, I feel honored that all? I can I can bring some Toronto insight to this uh, to this. Of course, and and you know you've got good roots there as well. So uh, Canada represent on this episode. Yeah, I was curious because I'm the only non-Canadian in this discussion. Like how much of Cronenberg's like visual style would you say is like that's just normal for Canada (laughs) (laughs) I would honestly say that it comes down to budget and that's a very Canadian (laughs) issue (laughs) that's fair and like I've only ever been to BC so like maybe in Ontario it just goes like shit just goes down like this it's the country (laughs) gas station and (laughs) we do have all those locales this is true yeah um I mean, look, people come to Canada to film because it's cheaper. You can afford, you're like the American dollar goes so much further there and there's tax credits and all this other stuff. I think in the late nineties, a lot of that stuff wasn't in place except for the, you know, the, the difference in the dollar. So this is like coming to the end of an era of Canadian filmmaking before we get into kind of where we're at today, where technology is caught up. It's cheaper to shoot things on digital and everything looks much better. And, you know, he would have been shooting on film back then. And, uh, you know, film is expensive. So, you know, it's like right at the tail end of an era that that is kind of hokey looking 
to kind of, I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, you know, this came out the same year as the matrix. So like, it's, oh, it's wow. kind of, yeah, <laughs> I was, seriously. Well, I think that's really interesting, right? That those, but I think two, the matrix it, had a much bigger budget, oh, obviously. I, and, and hundred percent better CGI. <laughs> this has uh, some, some weak CGI, but it's of its time. So, you know, there's that. Yeah. There's something, for. there's something very specific, like low budget energy, um, look in the nineties, right. That I think mm-hmm. you're kind of tapping into here. I, but he so also I'm... loves that. I think, sorry, I think Cronenberg really loves this sort of indie feel of, of, of mm-hmm. a lot of his films. And, and there's just like this sense of like, you know, you're watching a Cronenberg film when you watch one of his films, even in mon- some of his higher budget stuff. So I don't know if it's like purely budget or if it's filmmaker or it's a marriage of both with this one. It's kind of hard to say. Sorry to interrupt. No, 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 absolutely. Well, I'm curious what everyone's relationship with Cronenberg is because it's he's such a specific, you know, he is the like the body horror guy. So do you all like, are you into Cronenberg? Have you watched a bunch of his movies? What, you know, I think this is the first time we're all watching Existence for this. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Yep. First time. Yeah, I, I'm i like the worst kind of experience with Cronenberg. I've only seen Eastern Promises and A History of Violence. So I don't feel like that's as like my sister who's 10 years older than me she was like oh my god I can never watch another Cronenberg movie after seeing Dead Ringers like she has that experience with it um and I mean this I have to say like I dug it it was very stupid but it was also like so much fun that I was like oh I'm (laughs) wait I've seen The Fly okay but anyway I was like I get this I'm into it even having researched it though and to put like some information into the show notes I watched it and I was like Oh yeah, this is from 1992. Like there was no way when I realized it was from 99, I was shocked. But yeah, that's my Cronenberg touch point. Uh, for me, I, I totally agree. It does have this weird 1992 feel to it. And it's shocking that it's 1999. But uh, my experience with Cronenberg is pretty light as well. Even though he's a Toronto darling in the film scene, I've only seen a handful of his things and not a ton of his, a lot of his body horror stuff is earlier on in his career. And then Mm -hmm. he gets more, I think, psychological. I think the movie, I think the movie before this was Crash or uh, Crash would have been something that I saw um, when it came out and was very uh, confused and titillated by, because I just didn't know what the hell was going on, but was so intrigued by it because I was just the right age of teenager to, to just, be confronted with with so much sex and violence on screen and uh and before that of course i had seen the fly uh and some of his later films as well which are much more um uh grown up in feeling but um i had never seen this one i've been wanting to see this one for a very long time and so this gave me the excuse to and i think i had my hopes up high about it um <laughs> i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And I was a little bit disappointed by it. Yeah. Well, so, okay. I've never, so because crimes of the future, it just came out the local, one of the local movie curators here in LA did a whole series of Cronenberg retrospective um, American Cinematheque. And I only got to go to one of those films, which was the history of violence. So I've only ever seen the history Mm. of violence. I've never seen any of his other movies. Um, and so I was, you know, like I was told that this is like a weird video gamey thing. Like I had a friend who was like, I think if you're going to watch any, like you should check this one out. So I was excited that we had this on the list. And let me tell you this movie, I was like, it was like this weird, like it's so weird and joyous it, to watch it as someone who understands the video game industry and be like, oh, this is totally wild. Like I, it, it, it does have all the body horror elements. And I was like, oh, that does kind of fit in with this myth, you know, the, the mythology of the future VR and the metaverse and all of that kind of stuff. And so like this imagining of it, which does feel like an early nineties kind of energy, um, you know, as dumb as this movie is, it's kind of entertaining. Yeah. It's definitely entertaining. I, I will give it that. Um, I, I was texting you, Anita, last night about it. And I was like, oh, I got to save this for the podcast because I was kind of fired up while I was watching it. But it had that energy of someone who had never played a video game before <laughs> making a movie about video games. Like, yeah. I don't really picture Cronenberg sitting down and like really exploring video games. It was just the idea of video games that he riffed on, in my opinion. He might 
be a huge gamer for all I, I saw, know. I saw a lot of reviews that were like, Cronenberg's never played a video game. And like, that's funny. And I think it's hilarious, but I also think it's not accurate. And like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't, I don't know the man. Um, but I think that there's like, I, I can't quite articulate why I like have a sort of defensiveness to that take, even though I think it's funny. And part of it is because it is taking, it's extrapolating the, like the core function of gaming, which is this sort of, I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm going to caveat this, but this sort of like escapist fantasy where you get to go into these games and be these other people and be assassins and spies and like do all this stuff um, and take it into like, what if you were corporealized in that space? Right. Which was, mm. you know, uh, just a little bit of context here of there are two big waves of VR, right? One was mm-hmm. in the 90s, um, which, you know, when we talk about like Johnny Mnemonic, we're going to like get into some of <laughs> that stuff that's in that space, right? So like you have this like huge wave of VR that kind of went nowhere. It yeah. just flopped completely. And then about like five, six, seven years ago, um, VR exploded again, right? And partly because Facebook um, started Oculus um, and really infused just shit tons of cash into like making VR a thing. So VR is here, but it hasn't, it's not quite like- Still hasn't taken off. Yeah, in like a weird it's way. still very into like, unless you're really into gaming, the headsets are expensive. They're kind of clunky. Yeah. Like it's a little bit awkward. So what I think is interesting here is that we are having this transition from VR into metaverse. And what's so funny to me is that the metaverse is not a thing, but all of a sudden everybody is talking about it. Like even people that aren't in gaming or any of this, right? So, so like you go to games conventions now and like everything is about VR and Bitcoin, not not Bitcoin, Jesus. Everything is about VR and, um, and fucking, uh, NFTs, right? Like that's Mm. just like the new thing. But the actual metaverse is this fantasy that these dudes with a lot of money are trying to make happen kind of based on these sorts of movies, right? Like they read Ready Player One in the eighties and they watched these movies and they're like, what if we did everything in the metaverse, right? What if someday the technology will develop enough so that it feels comfortable to sit inside, right? Cause you're not gonna wear a headset. Mm-hmm. They're really uncomfortable. Um, And so I think there's something really interesting about this movie being a part of that legacy that's bringing us to today, where like millions of dollars are being spent to help us leave this dystopian world that we're in and exist in this digital space. I I definitely think COVID was something that really benefited VR and pandemic like lockdowns because people are just like, I want to escape this reality. And that definitely helped push a lot of headsets as well. I picked one up over the pandemic and I've used it a bunch and I use it less and less and less because I just don't want to get all the stuff out and clear furniture mm-hmm. out of the way and then get the headset on and stuff like that. But, and what I but like what about this- what happens when it's just eyeglasses, right? Like I know. what happens when I mean, it's like- sometimes just- I'll like- in your retina, yeah. right? <laughs> like right. When, when it's like a plug jacked into the back of yeah. your head, right? Like That's the thing. I, I think that's what's so great about Cronenberg's version of it is he he finds a way to like sexualize it and make it about like penetration and and body horror in his own weird way. But he also has this idealized version where you plug in, it's a biometric, you know, connection and you can just lie there, but then exist in the world because it just taps into your nervous system and your brainstem and whatever and gets up in there. And then, you know, you feel like you're in the world. That's so easy and, and idealistic compared to like getting all this equipment out and blah, 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 blah. So he does, he definitely, I think does the, one of the best jobs of making it convenient for his characters to get into this video game. Well, I think, and I, I'm not sure I'm not the person to speak to like, has Cronenberg played a video game? Although you sent me that letterboxed review you saw Anita like 10 minutes before we started recording that said he never had to which I countered, but he's definitely eaten ass. And I do think that that is just worth noting. Um, but <laughs> When we talk about Cronenberg, it's like the first thing we talk about. Um, of but the, what's interesting to me about this movie, and I only watched it yesterday, I kind of wish I'd given myself a few extra days to like sit with it, is everything that was so stupid in the moment, I do think the movie kind of answered for with the, yep. you know, reveal at the end. And, you know, stuff where I was like, what is this accent work that's happening? It seems even too amateur for like these Oh yeah. For Jude Law, who's already like been a big movie star or 
Um, why does she not understand what's happening in this moment? Like if she's the designer, clearly we're in some sort of like sub reality. But what I think is really uh, compelling about this movie and even before watching it, I had seen this blurb that he was inspired by the fatwa placed against Salman Rushdie for the satanic verses. And I thought, all right, he has like a high concept and he's going to try to apply it to something that's topical and does it work, does it not work. But watching it, I realized like he's just using the language of 1999 to explore themes that have been explored for generations. It's like this dreamscape reality, like dream versus reality thing that's been, you know, in literature forever. Uh, what is reality? And something I really liked about Christian, you were talking about the way they plug in and it's like really kind of seamless in this, in the way they're in that like hotel room is it just looked like they were like shooting up. Like they had had a, right. a drug experience and now they're just kind of like, oh, I don't want to come out of this. Like, I want to just go back. Can't we just go back in? And I was like, this doesn't have to be about a VR or video game. This is just about like when you escape reality and facing it again is difficult. Like this doesn't have to be a, a tech or a cyber movie. Um, but because it is, there's like a, a hilarity watching it in 2022. Um, but I'm curious, like I, I actually want to read some reviews. Like it seemed like fairly positively received, except for the fact that it came out after the Matrix. <laughs> and so right. people were like, well, bullet time is the only thing we're ever going to do in movies ever yeah. again. I mean, I feel like everyone's screwed after the Matrix. Like it yeah. Yeah. ruined everyone. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that there's like, so the, okay, obvi- like the sexual connotation is not an undertone, right? Like it's very, she's like, you know, lubing up, like they're yeah. both like licking fingering, and lubing, lubing and up, fingering, the yeah. whole thing. And um, I was just like, I rolled my eyes at all of that. Cause not that I'm like, part of me is like, fine, whatever. Like that's funny, I guess. But part of me was like, I wonder what this would be without that. Right. Mm. If it wasn't, a, if it, because that piece of it felt like the Hollywood glitz that you have to put on to tell the story. But I think that there's something interesting in and of itself of just the like jacking into these headsets and living in this world. And even like the in-game stuff, which is related to the sexualization where like they're about to fuck and he's like, I don't want to do this, but I can't stop myself. Like the character, like being in the game, the character forces you to do things, which I also think is really interesting because in video games there, you know, people will talk about like open world games where you can do anything you want to do, but like, that's not true. There are, there are lots of games, like they're all scripted and they're all programmed and there's like limited amount of options. And like, you kind of have to go into certain pathways and certain trajectories. Right. And so I think there's something really interesting about like your physical body is being dictated by code that is telling you what you have to do, right? So I think it's more interesting, like sex in the game is more interesting than like sexual innuendo attached to um, the the actual components, like the controller and that sort of thing. Well, there's also a a seeming loss of consent. Like if your character doesn't want to have sex, but it's in the code that your character mm-hmm. has to have sex to progress the game, or that this is just something that's written into the DNA of the character and then it must, even though the, the controller, the person, I don't even know what to call them anymore. I mean, there's like avatars and controllers, but the person seemingly in control is not in control of their consent, which is, which is, or, or... They uh, just clicked through the t- terms of service That's true. real quick. <laughs> they, they, they did not read the, the fine print. <laughs> yeah. um, totally well, this, possible. This is like what Westworld, I didn't finish watching Westworld, but it, like the new Westworld approach this, which is like how once we really get to a design level or a level of technology where the lines are so blurred between what's the game and what's reality, like that's when we start to care about stuff like consent where I was, I I haven't ever played this game, but I was watching a streamer play Detroit become human. And it was like, yeah, it's just a streamer I liked. And I was like, am I interested in watching this? And then I realized I wasn't, but um, the, it's so hard to care because they don't look like real people. They're just on the edge of the uncanny Valley. 
And in like Westworld, you have that, that question of like, well, are, are these people, do they count as real people? So in this, I think it's the same kind of question. Like if these were sort of eight bit characters <laughs> that were ambling about, I don't think we'd care as much like who gets mm-hmm. shot or who's, you know, cut in half or whatever <laughs> happens to them. Um, but in, instead it's re- it's reality. It really blends like, I don't think any VR has actually made anybody think they're at, really in it. The most advanced one is still not there. Right. Right. Although I will say that like some of the, there, there are moments in VR where you're like, oh fuck a box. Like you think you're going to walk through a box. Like, sorry, start again. There are some moments in <laughs> VR that I like games that I played where, you know, you can, you're just in a space and like, there's nothing in your physical space. But when you see a box in VR, you're like, oh, I can't, I have to walk around the box. Or like, if you're, if they're like heights and mm-hmm. like walking on a tightrope, you like, there, are, there is a very physical response that comes oh, from, yeah. <laughs> from that. So even there, it, yeah. I, I was playing ping pong in VR with a friend of mine. We both had headsets on. We were in the same room, pretty much like the same distance you would be playing ping pong at. That's just us being dumb. But we were trying out the ping pong game because uh, he had just got his set. And uh, we were just amazed at how even the haptic response of the of the controllers mm. made it feel like you were actually hitting mm. the ping pong. And I just played real ping pong the other day and it felt exactly the same. Uh, and then I went, I, I was laughing about a shot I made and then I went to lean on the table and I fell right through the table <laughs> and onto the ground. And I had forgotten that like, oh my God, this table isn't real. So, yeah. you know, it does start to fuck with your perceptions of reality. Yeah, admittedly the most advanced headset I've tried is Google Cardboard. So <laughs> that's yeah. a few years. <laughs> it's, it's the same. Although yeah. accessibility question, all three of us wear glasses. Like I don't have uh binocular vision like I don't really have depth perception because of my eyes like I wonder if that would also be affected in a VR experience well you can there- get lenses that you put into the VR set yeah. that match your prescription which I if I played a ton of VR I would totally invest in that but I had the spacers put in so that I could fit my glasses and I usually yeah. like these are big old chunkies I need to like put on smaller glasses to like fit in there and then they fog up a little bit or you get hot and sweaty doing VR and, yeah. uh, or at least I do. And, uh, and it's just always a pain in the ass. Someone like, designed constantly. a game where I can catch a ball for the first time and it will blow my mind. <laughs> Don't worry. When Absolutely. we all jack into the mainframe, your vision will be yeah. perfect in our cyborg future. So, you know, we're, we're almost there. That's a good point. Uh, That's a good yeah. point. <laughs> One of the things that I thought was really interesting from the beginning was, um, like the, the, how, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been to a video game conference or ever seen like video game shows, but the, the, like the whole energy of, um, existence oh my by, God. Yeah. by uh, who is it? Oh by my God. Uh, audience or whatever. I've, uh, no antenna, um, uh, yeah. exercise by antenna, exercise by antenna. I, I was just like, oh, you totally picked up on like the just like corporate branding that happens, but it was also in a church. Yeah. And, like, in a church so with that, a small amount of people. Yeah. That's and, a budget and, thing. That is a Canadian <laughs> filming <laughs> budget thing. Like they, the production manager was probably like, uh, I know you want an arena full of people, uh, but, <laughs> but we can also give this you isn't... for free a little church. Yeah. But also with it's, some over enthusiastic extras. Of all yeah, ages. Well, well, so, okay. Yeah, so yeah. all ages, pretty diverse like in terms of- A couple grandpas in there. <laughs> yeah, who yeah. are like, antenna. <laughs> Which I was like, I love that. Like as yeah. a representation of like people of all ages and all backgrounds game, but also like it's a it's a, um, um, QA testing. So, yeah. you know, it's like, it's like um, not QA testing, but like- Yeah, a, yeah, yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? Focus, focus, focus group. Um, yeah. yeah. So like, yeah. so it had the energy of like a big stage performance, but it also was just like a couple people who are getting paid fifty bucks to like tell you yeah. tell you what you think about the game. But and so, but that was that, in the game. But then later they had the so that was in the game. So you could almost write that off as like a quirky in-game feature. But then when they plug out and they're doing like the Q and A afterwards, you realize, oh no, they're still in the same space. And it's still <laughs> yeah, just it's the same thing. Well, yeah. and then the other thing that I was like, whoa, was that like the world's most famous game designer is a woman? I was like, fuck yeah, man, that's awesome. Um, 
and you know, the whole nineties crimped hair thing. This is part of why it felt so nineties as well. It was just like the fashion and aesthetic. The shiny was so, pants. Uh, and just the, like the clip on crink, like crimped hair, right. That just yeah. like the little pieces of it. Um, I but like so, to imagine they crashed an AA meeting and that that's why they were in a church. And they were like, if you yes. can all stay an extra hour, you'll it get did the have that bucks. vibe. You'll get a yeah. Tim Hortons yeah. gift certificate. Oh, nice. Tim nice Hortons, Canadian nice reference. reference well there. done. Thank, Thank you. Job. 10 points. Thank you. 10 um, Canadian points. So that's I was like going to say, like, points. <laughs> yeah. like seven points. You'll yeah. get one Timbit. That's that's what you'll get. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, but the cinnamon ones, those are always my favorite. Is little... Not a Bieber Timbit? I don't even want to know what that is. Bieber has uh, his own like line of Tim Hortons snacks now. Wow. Yeah, you, you've you been down here too long. I just came back yeah. from, from there and like he's got his own, like they call it like Tim Biebs. Like it's like a <sighs> Justin Bieber, Tim Hortons Cat's collab. Cat's Googling this right now. <laughs> <laughs> I would, but I have a, uh, I was going to Google a thing to ask you about instead. I'm going to ask you about it even worse, but I'll, Wait, I'll hold need, on. I want you to hold- make your point. Uh, hold on. What is the, yeah. I want to talk more about female game designer representation. Yeah, yeah. It can Is it? Okay. Is this related to Timbits? <laughs> no, it's re- it's related to like Canadian mm-hmm. production. I do have a real question oh, yeah, about go. Canadian go. production. So this, I- I'm just curious if you've heard about this. So as I understand it, and Christian, you were talking about like this kind of end of the nineties, a little bit different, like previously what Canadian production was versus what it is now. As I understand it, it that was around the time that the government started funding production a lot more so that there would be at least 50% or 60% of content made would be Canadian production. And that was CanCon. CanCon. So there's a lot of like um, incentives for that. But now this year, 2022, they're trying to extend that to digital content. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if you've heard anything about this. Like I've only heard about this from like YouTubers who are saying, theoretically, it would be great if this was the sort of thing that would you know, um, help indigenous creators get seen more because they would have more opportunities, but trying to discern what is CanCon if you're like, if you're a streamer and you, and you aren't spending production budget in Canada, you're spending production budget with YouTube and like Google's an Mm -hmm. American company. Like, I just don't know if you've heard anything about this, because I think this is a big this will be a big thing. It's a big thing it. in conversation for sure within yeah. the industry. I think CanCon is more concerned or initially was more concerned with like the big streaming platforms like Netflix mm. and Amazon and, and things like that. So that the reason we have CanCon Canadian content is so that we can promote Canadian artists and filmmakers. And uh, it's the reason like growing up in the 90s and, and in the 2000s, I have so much extra music knowledge of like all these artists that never made it to the States, but were promoted heavily in Canada because they were Canadian. And so the Mm. radio had to play a certain amount of music in support of Canadian artists, which was great because tragically hip, which no American knows, but it was like one of the biggest bands ever in Canada, huge bands. And then even like a ton of like pop hits and pop acts that you guys didn't get. Um, you know, I was listening to a friend's CanCon Spotify playlist the other uh, day and I was like, oh my God, all these bangers that I know all the, all the words to no American knows whatsoever, but these are awesome songs. And I, I fucking love them. And I, and I like, will listen to that playlist for, forever. Like I, I love that music. And it was because it was kind of force fed to us in Canada, mm. just so that we didn't have a complete cultural like cannibalism of the US. exactly totally. exactly which is which is how the u.s kind of spreads media and always has and and it's important to sort of protect your cultural identity a little bit against that um as much as the american stuff is great you know you want to you want to get some local artists going as well and that makes a, a healthier and robust um artistic community and the same goes for filmmaking and television so they're they're concerned with netflix having just a ton of content but not investing in mm-hmm. Canada and paying taxes on Canadian productions and, you know, helping support the system. And then looping YouTube into that, I think is maybe not the right thing to do. That should, I, I don't know enough about it. I haven't looked it up recently, but if it's all lumped into the same thing, that's, that's a little bit, I mean, where do you draw the line? Do you draw the line at TikTok? Do you draw the line at people making, you know, sketches that they put up on Instagram and stuff like that? 
Um, do you get uni acting unions involved? Mm. It becomes a very tricky thing. The lower the budget goes and the more sort of independent the producer goes. Um, and I don't know if we should be mixing in those smaller streams of revenue and content creation with like the big studios like Netflix and Amazon and things like right. that. But I don't know enough of how much the bill that they're trying to pass in, in, in through the government is mixing all of that into one and just calling it digital. Yeah. I mean, I'm paying attention to it just because I think it's really interesting, but agree that like, it's probably a minority of the creators that we're talking about that would be these types of like mm -hmm. streaming or. But it could be content. a big help. Like you said, with indigenous creators, you know, it would be nice to see more of their content come across in the algorithm in Canada or something like right. that. When, when videos are suggested to you, I think that's kind of how CanCon would work with YouTube yeah. and things like that, that you would just get a few more things local locally um put on your algorithm if the, if it's not already in place i'm not sure because i tend to get um you know creators digital creators from toronto on my feed all the time for some reason uh i've noticed that recently so i don't know if that's already in place or not right. but um i definitely see a, a value and a worth in cancon as long as it doesn't stifle creativity and revenue streams for you know uh independent producers yeah all right. Thank you. Um, I was wow. excited to actually talk to a human about that instead of just, again, <laughs> passive media right. consumption. Right. All right. So Anita, you were talking about how we have um, the crimped hair, shiny pants, ski boot carrying most important game designer of all time until we don't. Yeah. And I, I think that's really interesting because so one of the things um, that I've talked about in the past in terms of representation is when there when a piece of media tells a story that's pretty tropey and like might be bad for women or marginalized identity. And then at the very end, it flips it. So like a video game example of this would be Braid, right? Where it's this man going to rescue a woman, um, like the damsel in distress. And at the very end, you learn that like, you're actually the bad guy, like that kind of energy. Mm. Um, this is the opposite of that, where you have the whole movie, you actually are like, this is this dope ass female game designer that like is, you know, world revered. And then at the very end, um, you find out that that wasn't true. Question, question mark. <laughs> we right. don't know what happens. Um, and I think, and I was trying to process that because my argument is if you spend two hours or 10 with a, a video game or whatever, where you're, you think that you're just saving a damsel, I don't really, the twist is interesting, but it doesn't change the fact that you spent all this time thinking that you were, you know, this, this man was rescuing this damsel. I, I think it actually, I think that my logic is consistent here. Where like, I think it's pretty cool that you spend the whole fucking movie with a female game designer as the like, you know, world's best game designer. And that it kind of bummed me out at the end when you're like, oh, she's just a nobody. But she's not like, she is at the end, a terrorist <laughs> or, a, or a revolutionary not, because yeah. it's the inception of video games, right? Like, is right. that also a video game? Like that was the energy that the film ended with, right? It's yeah. like, how many layers deep, how many, how many church focus groups yeah. are we going to be going through? <laughs> how many <laughs> layers of fake dog fur to pull back and reveal? Oh a my God. <laughs> um, I, oh brother. <laughs> that was I, incredible. Oh, the dog I, metaphor was great through the whole movie too. That that dog just kept carrying bone guns to people. It was wonderful. Um, okay, speaking of bone guns, um, for <laughs> for our viewers who are watching this and not listening, bone I wore my perfect. special tooth necklace uh -oh. just for this recording. Uh, it was created by an um, I forget who made this, but it was a woman that I met that made this like all this like really cool tooth jewelry. Uh, and I thought it would be appropriate for this recording. Is that the equivalent of like, like dudes wearing like a big piece of like a bullet on a necklace and stuff like yes. that? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Now kind of, it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this only is my in threat. This is my walking threat. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, Understood. The other representation thing that I found really frustrating was the Chinese restaurant. Mm -hmm. Um, so like in, in the world, you see a sign about the Chinese restaurant that they send you to, you have to go eat the Chinese restaurant. You have to kill the Chinese server. Um, and I, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a Chinese restaurant in a movie. The problem is that like, it was created to be like the foreigners who will eat anything, 
right? Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like really kind of riffing on that, like the the kind of horror and way that Americans talk about like Chinese eating dogs and like dog meat and that sort of thing. It was that same energy where like they're serving you this horribly disgusting dish that is, you know, this cute little creature that we just saw a few minutes ago and yeah. then like stuffing it down. And then there's this like, I, I thought the tooth gun was fucking cool. <laughs> I was it's, like really into it's it. That production one of the design. most creative parts of the whole film is the yeah. tooth gun and how you put but, it together for sure. Totally. But that energy, I was like that this feels wrong and gross. And I didn't yeah. like that. But the, you know, part of part of I think the the tooth gun and like the that whole thing, I think, was great. But also even like the controller, like the practical effects in this, like I love a practical effect. Right. Yeah. Like I think we we just so inundated with CGI that like when you do see these practical effects, you're like, OK, this is fun and cool and interesting. Mm-hmm. And like you know, the controller was like extra gross <laughs> because it's like very biological. Nipply. Yeah. Like, very like nubbly and nipply and you just got to like flick it to turn it yeah. on. <laughs> You're like, how? So how, Cronenberg. Yeah. You're like, when, when does the orgasm happen? Like how yeah. much do I need to yeah. grab this clip before? His, it goes? <laughs> his thought process was probably like, oh, to turn it on, you actually have to turn it on. So yeah. <laughs> flick it, play with oh, it. Oh man. But it, um, bop it. Bop it. <laughs> for sure. But it was uh, like really just jarring to think of like, this is puppetry in this movie and it's 1999. Like that does feel actually crazy to me, but. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, th- I can't say it's a good movie, you know, but like, I just, I'm fascinated by it. Like the whole time I was like, what's going to be? And then like, the whole, the NPC, the non-player character in the world where you're like, oh, you have to like, you, like, this is why I'm like, he doesn't know nothing about video games. Like right. the NPC, you have to directly address them and you have to say the right. thing that they need you to say to be able to get through the next checkpoint. Like that's accurate <laughs> to video yeah. games. Like little details like that, I thought were really interesting. For the whole premise of it though, of like, they're, you know, they're, you know, like death to Allegra or whatever. And like, there's this like whole underground. I like I, that went over my head. I was like, why do they want to kill her? I don't understand because she's like bringing in the future. The like, the- I think it's like also kind of carrying off some of the, the censorship that was being pushed through the eighties into the nineties as video games kind of came more and more to the forefront and mm. were pretty violent. Like you had games like doom back then and rise of the triad and first person shooters really coming around where they were just essentially like you were slaughtering other people. It was our, not that that was a new concept, but first person was kind of like the thing coming into the nineties where it was like, you actually, it's like you're in the video game. So riffing off of, of that a little bit, you had a lot of, you know, people just like um, in the eighties, there was, uh, it was a lot of the Nancy Reagan, don't do drugs and Mm -hmm. Tipper Gore uh, violence in in music and video like cop killer and like you know bringing musicians into congress to sort of argue about then you have the some whole of the jack Thompson stuff that they in created the 90s trying to right. ban video games and and right. then you know columbine they, happens, they're still trying and it. that's they're still trying to do games. that absolutely yeah video games are always everyone wants to play video games for everything it's kind of hilarious actually yeah. <laughs> like yeah. like yes there are lots of things around video game culture that are not great but like that's not this is not the way to do no um so you yeah. so you think that that's it's pulling in the that like i think part of that i mean when you explain and- him talking to salman rushdie and the fatwa against him after satanic uh uh um satanic verses is that mm-hmm. is that the book yeah um uh i think you kind of merit put those two together and that kind of explains that whole angle as things are taken to so the i extreme. get that but i don't like i get that but i also am like but in the game i mean in the movie sorry like the fuck was the premise <laughs> you know like i got like I, I get the where it comes from from the world but like in the game i guess the energy is that like she's bringing in this future and the people who are not plugged in are trying to stay organic or whatever yeah right. i guess well, there was a lot of like it's a sign of the times i feel like was said two or three times and it had to do with the um genetic modification of these animals or some, you know, maybe it was affecting the environment, the ecosystem, like to try to keep technology from ruining biological life, perhaps. I'm meeting them more than halfway there, but. Yeah, I think you are, totally. You're being too kind to 
talking to him about that for sure. No, nope. it's it's hard to read. I mean, yeah, it's almost like he just had a really cool concept for a body horror live in video game. And then he tried to fit some sort of a message around it, but didn't quite get there by the end. He kind of by subverting everything at the end, you're just like, well, what's the point? Are you saying that video games are bad and we shouldn't have them or? Are you agreeing with the terrorists or? Yeah, right. Well, like what is, yeah. Hard well, hard to what, read. What are we, what are we walking away from this movie? Yeah. Um, I'd like to rewatch the Jumanji movie now that I, <laughs> the, the like new Jumanji because there was. Right. Like one thing about this and you you reminded me when you brought up the Chinese restaurant is that seeing the twist at the end, nobody had agency seemingly in what character they got to play. So mm-hmm. like you're a Chinese Canadian guy and you go to this focus group and you go to play a video game and you end up being the guy who works at the Chinese restaurant, like Willem Dafoe and Ian Holm are talking about like, oh, I can't believe the character I got to play. So that <laughs> really reminded me of like Jumanji, which it's a little more explained where like, oh, oops, I pressed this button. And I guess that means I have to play the girl or I have to play the, the you know, non-athletic guy or whatever. Um, but yeah, like even that, I was like, I could kind of understand like, oh, my character that I chose made a decision because it was the only decision my character could make. But if I was like, I didn't want to play as this character, I would just turn it off. <laughs> I wouldn't want to play that. Like that yeah, seemed like exactly. the hardest well, entry point. I'm curious what happens to you when you die in the game? Do you get to still watch the game happened? yeah yeah really yeah like is there a camera view <laughs> like what? yeah it, it turns just into watch like the a, rest and know what happens yeah being it's like john a movie malkovich style you know where you're just like all right i guess i'm yeah and who's whose trajectory are you following yeah exactly this i mean this is these are some of the holes that we encounter in this plot <laughs> for sure i mean uh for someone who's like the most popular game designer of all time and people being thrilled to like try this new game out and it's, you know, a huge privilege and people of all ages, even some, you know, grandfathers who look like they've never played a video game ever. uh, It's kind of just a really poorly designed game. It's not a very good game. You know, if I was a user and, and they took, you know, some aspect of, of my look and just applied it to a character that's only in there for five seconds. And I'm like, that's it. Like, can I restart this or yeah. is that all I get to play? Like, that kind of yeah, sucks. Exactly. How much did what, I pay it, for this? These are fucking roguelikes. Like you spent, you spent all this money <laughs> making holes in your body and then you like yeah. die in a minute and you're done. I'd rather yeah. play hit by a car. <laughs> hit by a car. <laughs> I bet that was a reference to Crash because I, I, the whole, <laughs> every time I saw that, I was like, he's just giving a shout out to Crash. He just wants people to watch that movie because... Not enough people did. Not enough people watch Cronenberg movies in general because they're polarizing, I think. Right. Like I'm he's excited. super popular. He's done yeah. a lot for Canadian film and he's done a lot for, um, you know, body horror in general, but he's definitely niche and he's definitely uh, kind of a cult. He's, he's like Canada's Paul Verhoeven. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. Paul Verhoeven is treading to this territory with um, Total Recall, which is kind of a similar thing. What is reality? How much can I change? What memories can I put into my head? Uh, and that's going back to, I think it was a Philip K. Dick book that Total yeah. Recall is based on. But, you know, like you like you said earlier, there's there's tons of references to this in, in literature going back decades. So well, thinking about like Starship Troopers, which mm-hmm. is Verhoeven, and like that's mm-hmm. a movie that is supposed to be... Uh, ironic (laughs) and then a lot of the audience doesn't read it that way and they read it as like a really jingoistic like fuck yeah like we should be as militarized as possible and i want i bet there's like a section of cronenberg viewers who are kind of the same way who get into like the grossness or the violence without seeing the the humor that i think is supposed to be there at least in this movie oh yeah but it made me excited to watch more of his movies that i haven't seen and people are raving about crimes of the future. I also saw that he made a movie called crimes of the future in the seventies. And this current movie is not a remake of his original movie. It is just has the same title. <laughs> so oh my God. Like, are you serious? I didn't even know that. So confusing. I kind of love that. He's like, look, I've been at it for 50 years. <laughs> You're going to tread yeah. some of the same ground. Um, That's if amazing. listeners are interested, we have done several episodes on Verhoeven movies, <laughs> so including the newest Benedetta. 
which I did not like. Uh, oh, but I haven't yeah. seen that one yet. Yeah, we did that. We did um, um, cop, cop. Cop. Robocop. Robocop. <laughs> Thank you. Cop, cop, um, cop. Cop. <laughs> someone else. Someone I just keep saying yeah. it. Someone will say it. Um, and then uh we did an episode on Starship Troopers, which is not available anymore for reasons that we will not discuss. Um oh, but wow. uh Ebony the bugs got it. The, the bugs, bugs got it. it. It's true. Yeah. Um, but Ebony had very strong feelings about it being trash and not ironic and just fascist. And, uh, you know, there's like, it's very polarizing that film. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I don't mm. know what we're talking about for hope. I mean, I do know why, but um, I actually, watching these makes me want to watch more Cronenberg films, um, mm-hmm. but like spread out. Yeah. You know, like, it's not like I want to like binge them in a weekend kind of energy. I'm like, <laughs> that would be a very space. dark weekend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. definitely. Um, all right, y'all, we will take a little break and then we'll be back to share some freakouts. The Games and Online Harassment Hotline is a text message based, anonymous and confidential emotional support hotline. And it's created specifically for the gaming community because we're gamers and creators and we want to help each other. So how does it work? Well, you text us and we listen. Our hotline is 100% anonymous. We can talk about anything you need to and only what you want to. The Games and Online Harassment Hotline is an inclusive resource for anyone, no matter how you identify. If you feel that you need emotional support, you can start right now by texting SUPPORT to 23368 and our qualified responders will be there to listen to you, free of charge. Reach out, get help, and let's make this community a better place to work and play. Now it's time to talk about what's been thrilling us, moving us, upsetting us, or infuriating us this past week. I don't know why this looked like I was doing a fucking <laughs> cr- wrong movie. We're literally recording the Johnny Mnemonic episode right after this. And so oh, my brain you? is like mixed. And I was about to be like, oh, because there's the religious part of this movie. No, different fucking movie. All right. <laughs> Kat, what, is, what are you freaking out about this week or I'm com- lately? I am completely shifting gears to talk about the uh, Netflix series Heartstopper which is a very sweet romance series about teenagers. Um, I have so many people have told me to watch it. So I've only watched the first couple of episodes. I feel like there is a a little mini trend happening right now of like uh, teenage gay or queer content that is just like the premise isn't about how hard it is to come out or like it's not one of these like big sad stories. It's just like having a crush wondering if your friend might like you back. Oh, you know, I'm going to meet up with him after the rugby practice. Like, it's just a sweet show. It's based on a graphic novel, right? I believe so. And I think think the writer is the writer and EP of the series. Um, And it's... It, it's a British set show. It reminds me a little bit of sex education, but without like the kind of, um, it's not as like bombastic as sex education. It's much more just like the scenes of like them, the two boys texting each other back and forth and being like, thanks X. What does the X mean? Does he, is he going to pick up on like, Oh, and then like delete triple dot delete. No problem. You know, and it's like that sort of thing. And I'm like, oh, it's so sweet. It's just really nice. And I'm only a few episodes in, but by the time this airs, I probably will have tweeted a bunch about how cute it is. So totally nice. different. That's what I'm freaking out about. Great. Christian, you freaking out about anything? Yeah, I've got a couple of books. I just realized I'd given the book that I just finished away, but I traded it for another book from the same author. Um, I'm a little behind on this, but Madeline uh, Miller so I, I haven't read Cersei yet, yes. but uh, we have I just had finished multiple, The Song of Achilles. We have had so multiple freakouts about Cersei on this podcast. I've read it. You should hit me up when you're done reading it. We can okay. talk about it. I it's, will. It I will. I'm places. looking forward to it. The yeah, Song yeah. of Achilles was awesome uh, because I'm a history nerd and I love ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient Egypt and just ancient history in general. And getting a really in-depth perspective on like The Song of Achilles goes into uh, uh, the Siege of Troy and also Achilles relationship. And uh, it's just, it's such a fascinating look at and different perspective than we hear in, in a lot of the sort of stuffier history um, write-ups on, on these, these myths. And uh, I really dig that. And uh, Madeline Miller is just such an evocative writer that um, really takes you there, really enjoy it. 
Um, and I'm reading another book right now. Uh, this is very Canadian, so it's kind of CanCon. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a book. It's called The Whisper on the Night Wind uh, by Adam Schultz, S-H-O-A-L-T-S. And it's about a guy who goes up into the wilds of Labrador uh, in northern Canada uh, with a friend in search of a cryptid of like mm-hmm. some monster that was attacking people a hundred years ago that there are multiple accounts about. And so they go up into the middle of nowhere to sort of retrace the steps of some of these reports and see if there's some sort of a cryptid up there or what that is coming from, which is like, it, it hits all the things that I love. It, it's got adventure. I love canoe trips. Personally, I go on them every once in a while with my, my closest buds up in Northern Ontario It has a little bit of like mystery with the cryptid stuff, which is just kind of weird and wacky. Um, And it's got like the idea of going somewhere desolate and away from people, which I'm always attracted to, like places on the edge of of civilization Mm. in the middle of nowhere where nobody knows you're there. There's something so attractive to that, uh, to me about that, especially in this day and age where everything is just so fucking crazy, especially in a city like Los Angeles. And my other thing that I'm freaking out about is every morning I've started walking for half an hour before I even have a coffee, which is unheard of, but someone suggested that to me. And I just go for a 30 minute walk. As soon as I wake up, I strap on shoes and just get outside and just walk. And it's kind of the nicest thing in the world to do for yourself. I highly recommend it. It's a weird freak out for sure, but but I'm, I'm into it. Nice. So, I, it's good for your health. It's for your health I've people. I've been to, trying to do that too. Like I used to go on really big long walks every morning and I've tried to I just love be those. like, yeah. cool, 20 minute, like quick little 20 minute, maybe during lunch. Like it, I think it helps with a lot of like depression and just like malaise mm-hmm. and being yeah. stuck in front of a computer all the time. It's a reset. Definitely. Um, now, Anita, I'm excited for yours because I just <laughs> saw this movie yesterday. What is your freak out? My freak out is a letterbox review about Top Gun Maverick that um, somebody else, not the person who wrote it, posted on Twitter and it just like wildfires. Um, I so I'm not I'm not going to freak. I'm not going to review Top Gun Maverick, um, but. Well, well, I go, OK, whatever. I uh, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm trying to say. OK, a lot. So the in the movie spoilers, whatever um, they are like, it's this enemy without a face. Right. It's just general, generic, yeah. whatever. I immediately was like, oh, that's a Ron. Like just 100 mm, percent immediately. Yeah, yeah. E- e- exactly. And so. Um, but a lot of people were like, oh, it's just a generic enemy and da, 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 whatever. It doesn't matter. Maybe it's Russia. And I was like, no, it's fucking Iran, like full on. I don't I can't quite name why, but I know why. And part of it is like global history and understanding <laughs> international relations. And so um, a lot of people are just like, wow, it's amazing. Movie, blah, 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 blah. This review gave it half a star and was like pages of taking it down. And it's fucking brilliant. I want to read a couple of excerpts. Yes. Top Gun Maverick is a movie where our heroes are trying to start World War III. The U.S. military is selecting pilots for a bombing run over an Iranian nuclear facility near completion, one which was built, quote unquote, in violation of an internationally recognized treaty. This, of course, is the exact opposite of what happened in real life. The U.S. violated the JCPOA agreement with Iran and the Iranian government continued to obey it even when we no longer were. Um, It goes on. Like all successful fascist narratives, this movie portrays our enemies as simultaneously all-powerful and extremely weak. To craft a story where our ludicrously overfunded heroes can be underdogs, it is necessary to pretend that Iran has advanced fifth-generation fighters, which are superior to U.S. capabilities. This is brought up repeatedly, regardless of how absurd it is. Yet when our heroes are actually in Iran, all of their pilots have the aim of a blind man. Tom, that's... Uh, a little ableist there. Tom Cruise survives a uh, 50 caliber machine gun right in front of him by taking cover behind a dead log. The 50 caliber bullet is designed to penetrate an armored truck engine. Anyways, it goes on and on (laughs) just like calling out all of these details. It's fucking brilliant. Um, I've gotten to several arguments with people who are like, I just don't see it. And I'm like, cool. And I, I feel like past me, uh, was less understanding of like differences of opinions and like would be like, what the fuck is wrong with you? And this is the one thing that made me actually be like, wait, I'm sorry. Like, are you just ignorant? Like, do you not know about global politics? Uh, so I'm going to share the link to this review if anyone else would like 
to have this conversation with people in their lives and to be able to see this film um, as magnificent as it was in terms of a like uh, action adventure. Uh, it is just like not only a like two hour commercial for the US military, it also all of these little pieces of it like really kind of undermines um, I, is kind of racist is what I'm trying to get at and like really fucked up in terms of the way that we think about Amer American politics, international politics, the Middle East. I'm very excited to read this. I uh, yeah. spent my post Top Gun Maverick viewing explaining to my unwilling friends why each of the men in it had been canceled. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. Usually I wait for people to like ask me and, but it, instead I was just like, well, <laughs> guess what he did. Um, and I also just, I mean, I have a, a toxic fascination with Tom Cruise and knowing that he's someone who had a Tom Cruise themed birthday party on David Miscavige's boat. The fact that this movie was entirely made for the audience of Tom Cruise, like he made this movie, the movie he would want to see. And there's something so fascinating to me about it. Um, also, yeah, I mean, it, it's an action spectacle and I like those and there's speech sport playing hot question mark um <laughs> so i'd like to be able to talk about this movie and know <laughs> anything other than just like explaining to my friend who hadn't seen the original like well instead of ice man it's hangman and instead of goose it's rooster and it is not movie. gay <laughs> at all there's no gay they just stripped all the gay out of this movie which i knew that they would but that was mm -hmm. also yeah. bummer uh, we should, I mean, I don't know why we didn't do a whole episode on this movie. Okay. I think you definitely should do, I, a, whole I kinda, you should do a whole episode on both films. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Definitely on both. Um, all right. Um, what's the, bleh. so right. the video version of this is going to have all this crap in it, but the yes, audio version right. is going to have none of it. It's going to be great. Um, I also like how the video version shows how nice your spaces are. And like, I just moved into this place. I have, I'm sitting in a corner in my kitchen. <laughs> nothing's on the walls it's just like blankness it's a void behind me and you guys have like these beautiful spaces to work in I so apologies a, for my will be beautiful too yes. buddy I, I had a pile of debris back here that i just moved right before oh yeah i'm like yeah. around sure. debris yeah that is our show for today thank you christian for joining us where can people learn thank more about you, you? Uh, on the socials at Mr. Christian Brune. Um, Christian Brune wasn't available, like the regular, just the name. So I had to add a Mr. to it. And it sounded a lot less douchey than the Christian Brune. So <laughs> at Mr. Christian Brune, to use in Brune, Christian with a K. I wonder if uh, it. it's, I wonder if, if the other Christian Brune is Norwegian in Norway and you could just like hostily take it over. I looked into it. He's Danish in Denmark. Oh, Danish. And apparently oh, it's you can't do that. to take. No, I the can't. Danes are mean. <laughs> the Danes are mean. No, apparently it's illegal to like offer to take someone's Instagram handle or something like that. I don't know. It's very, illegal it's very strange. Instagram? Maybe it's like, I think so. I don't know. <laughs> I looked into, cause I was like, well, is there any way I could ask him if I could have that name and he could go with something different? Like I asked a PR person that I was working on a project with and they're like, actually it's illegal to do that. I was like, what? I don't that doesn't sound think, right. I don't think that's true. I think, I think you need a new I think PR their person. point was, I know. I think that the, <laughs> their thing was they thought I was going to like offer to pay him for his mm. handle. And people I, do that shit all the time, like legal or not. People do that shit all the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't care that much about it, but I was just like, ah, oh, slap a mister on there. And we'll go. it goes with slap the mustache a, right now. So yeah. slap a mister. <laughs> just, slap reading. A, just slap a mister, people. Slap a mister. It's what we do here at Feminist Frequency yeah. Radio. <laughs> Good. 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 All right, y'all. I'm Anita Sarkeesian. You can find me at Anita Sarkeesian on all the things if you can figure out how to spell my name. I'm Kat Spada, and you can find me at Kat underscore EX underscore Machina on Twitter. And be sure to follow Feminist Frequency on all of the socials at FemFreak. If you are a Patreon subscriber, be sure to stick around for the bonus episode with our guest, Mr. Christian Brune, <laughs> to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you like our show, help other people find it by subscribing, rating, and commenting on your favorite podcatcher. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.